it's an honor to be here. And um, in just a few minutes, I hope uh, I can summarize about 30 years of experience with a small commercial apiary, or small by American standards at least. And it's located not far from here, just about three hours south, the Champlain Valley of Vermont. It's a dairy farming region. It's not actually typical of Vermont. It resembles more the dairy farming country of Wisconsin or, or Minnesota 20 or 30 years ago. But we have lots of resources for bees there. It's quite a good place for honeybees. It's possible to have a honey flow anytime during the uh, warm months. Our crop comes mostly from the different clovers, alfalfa, purple vetch, and we have, again, good resources in the fall, goldenrod and aster, and a huge buildup resource in the spring from dandelions, and also basswood and uh, black locust trees also. So the potential for really good conditions for bees until recently, it was a very uh, clean area too. We're starting to have, for the first time in my career, uh, some of the problems my queen customers in the Midwest have described um, for decades to me. But um, anyway, for, for many years, I have produced honey with about 300 colonies. I produce about between 400 and 600 nucleus colonies on standard cones to overwinter, and also maintained another 400 mating nukes for producing queens and catching queens. And those are maintained um, virtually year-round, overwintered also. So I just, I should say at the beginning here that the whole aim of, of this whole venture was just to have a, a pleasant, uh, healthy, and useful life living in the countryside without the need for another job or any other source of income. And by that measure, it has been um, uh, a much bigger success than I ever could have imagined at the beginning. So where did I get the inspiration for what I've done or the direction of the apiary? From nature first, of course. Thoroughly studied, but still inscrutable. A lot of the practical details of my apiary came that I lifted from, from Brother Adam's work. I just adapted it for our season, my, my environment, and uh, American equipment. I also was very inspired by some of the early pioneers of commercial beekeeping in the United States. This is A.E. Manum in his bee yard. I call him my neighbor because he lived just about eight miles from where I live now. He was one of the pioneers of uh, early commercial beekeeping without yards. And <clears throat> there are some great pictures in uh, some of the old books of him going to the out yard with his horses equipped with bee suits of their own. <laughs> and of course the bees themselves. Also the, the practical aspects of my apiary was inspired quite a lot by the work of Sir Albert Howard considered to be the father of uh, modern organic farming in the English-speaking world. And his conclusion after his lifetime of work was that pests and diseases should be always seen as friends and allies rather than enemies to be destroyed and that we should use them to tune up our, our systems, our agricultural practice. They should be used as indicators of where our practices are unbalanced or poorly adapted. And I also got a lot of inspiration from Masanobu Fukuoka, who brought agriculture and nature closer together than any other well-known person. So I always emphasize uh, when I talk about my apiary that it was only by a combination of breeding and management used together that I was able to succeed in eliminating all the treatments from my apiary and running it for many years um, uh, 
without, without any treatments at all. I used to focus on the breeding part as, you know, maybe the most important because we had to obtain a stock of bees that was not native to North America originally, but I'm not so sure now, and the, the management things are just as important, and these are the things that any beekeeper can use, no matter whether you're a commercial beekeeper with lots of colonies, a viable population yourself for breeding, or you just have a few colonies. And the key things about my management system began in 1989, uh, sorry, 1986 when I first discovered by accident that four-frame nucleus colonies could overwinter in my climate outdoors with just minimal protection. And this is the box that I have used the entire time, just a standard hive body divided in half with a feeder and uh, two colonies in that box. And this is the uh, my sort of optimum unit to overwinter my new queens and the, uh, the, the first colonies that they, they establish. And I won't go into the whole story of, of, of how this happened. I, I discovered it by accident. The, the old beekeepers uh, before packaged bees used this quite a bit in, in the climate where I live, but it had been forgotten once packaged bees came on the scene and bees could be obtained so easily from the cell. But after a couple of years of experimentation, I realized that with each unit um, arranged like this, with a two-story, a standard two-story colony down below, and then a nucleus box, just like the one I showed before on top, uh, wintered that way so there'd be three colonies in each stack instead of just one, that this would more than double the productive potential of the apiary and it also was the key to establishing real bee breeding and real produ production of excess bees in the very most northernmost parts of the U.S., which would no longer need to rely on uh, obtaining bees from elsewhere. And this was the way I overwintered all my colonies uh, for some years before the varroa mites came. The two-story colony below, it just has a normal wooden inner cover, and then the uh, nuke box on top, a piece of the blue styrofoam, and then the uh, cardboard cover to cover the whole thing. So that was the situation when the tracheomite arrived. And I was just ramping this system up, uh, starting to produce larger number of nucleus colonies, just starting to sell them. And the tracheomites came, and to us, that, that was, uh, this was 1989 in my location. This just seemed like the end of the world to us, where we were used to 5% winter loss, and suddenly we had 40, 50, 60%, or even more. But within just a few years, by just simply grafting from the most, um, the, the best surviving colonies, uh, after this invasion, in just a few years, the bees had regained all of their uh, resilience and strength and productivity. And in fact, they were actually better than the bees that I had were before I had the tracheomites. And this photo, I'd like you to try to remember what it looks like um, right now. This is in the early spring. You can see no grass has started to grow. And you tip the colony over and break it apart. Both boxes completely filled with bees and the top box still very heavy with honey. I never had bees anything like this before the tracheomites came. And that's what convinced me that the mites had actually helped me to select bees like this much better than I could have myself. And, and that's it. Okay, so anyway, that resulted in an apiary of three parts honey production, production of nukes on standard combs. And these were much superior to packaged bees and queen rearing. Raised all the queens, of course, for both nukes. And that was the situation when the varroa mites arrived. Things I added to help deal with the varroa mites was the isolated mating apiary. Um, I started keeping all the nucleus colonies in yards of their own. I started making my own foundation. 
And so my initial experiments, I, I knew having the confidence um, from having watched the effect of the tracheomites on the APR, I was hoping I could do the same thing with varroa mites. And I never would have attempted this or even thought of it if it hadn't been for my previous experience with the tracheomites. My initial experiments with leaving bees untreated revealed that the three parts of the apiary were very different in their susceptibility to damage. The uh, queen-bearing part of the apiary was able to live on its own even before I had any other resistant stock, but it was the introduction of the Russian bees that supplied the genetic component to my, my two-pronged um, uh, method for, for dealing with this. And this was the best thing the USDA ever did for me. And I'll just have to leave it there for now. But <laughs> as soon as I had the Russian type bees, the nucleus production on standard combs could proceed without treatments. And after selecting for a few years, the honey production part of the apiary was, I was also able to leave untreated. So the nucleus colonies haven't been treated since Let's see, 1980, 1998. And the last treatment on any part of the apiary was April of 2002. So these are just a few frames from some of my breeder colonies. interesting thing if you remember that slide about the uh, with the tracheomite selected colony this was the kind of colony that the varroa mite selected a much smaller cluster and you can see it's later in the spring the uh, grass is already starting to grow a completely different kind of bee resulted from selection by varroa mites and now some of my conclusions from all of this um, include that there, there has been a, a simple and straightforward solution to the varroa mite problem for commercial beekeepers who are stationary. There are now four beekeeper apiaries that have spun directly off of mine without treatments. This is not all of them. Some of them are other treatment tree beekeepers who worked it out on their own. But I think the real existential threat to beekeeping is not varroa mites, but the spread of industrial agriculture and the poisoning of our environment. <laughs> and one last thing though, I am pretty convinced the, the future of, of real healthy beekeeping, both for hobbyists and for commercial beekeepers, is going to succeed or fail along with organic farming. And that's what we need to support as beekeepers. The best thing we can do for the bees is to help create much better habitat for them. And so I don't know what else to do except host a few beekeepers at my place every year, expose them to this, and hope they'll go on to use it themselves. And just a couple pictures from this year, the year of a thousand swarms, and also a good crop of honey.